Hello everyone, hope you are feeling well. Um, <clears throat> some years ago, uh, I found that after having a bath, I itched uncomfortably for about 20 minutes. I ignored it for a long time until I finally spoke to a doctor who referred me to a dermatologist. After several appointments, I was given a diagnosis and uh, it seemed that I was suffering from a rare condition called, wait for it, aquagenic urticaria. Now clearly the first word relates to water and the second word, urticaria, I discovered means itching. I was informed what was wrong with me by the use of medical Latin which just combined itching with water. Reminded me of a friend of mine who was losing his hair, went to the doctor and was told he had alopecia and when he got it, uh, when he got home and looked it up in the dictionary it meant losing your hair, never mind. But now apart from antihistamines there was no medical cure, uh, so there it was. Some years later I was sitting drinking coffee with my son and his family in a cafe in Wales when suddenly I lost grip of the cup and spilt the drink. Uh, I ignored it again until later at a friend's funeral I seemed to lose control of my one arm for maybe 30 seconds. Back to, to the doctor who referred me this time to Heartland Stroke Clinic <clears throat> where I had a CAT scan on my head um, where they found uh, nothing, now don't be rude, they found no damage which suggested that I had had a stroke although they couldn't be sure. About two years ago following a routine uh, <clears throat> blood test it was discovered that I had too many red blood cells which made my blood too thick. This time I was referred to a haematologist who took a blood sample and sent it off for analysis. That showed <clears throat> I had what the medical profession call a mutated JAK2 gene which apparently provides instructions to cells for making the JAK protein. I don't understand it either. Now this was the reason that I had the itching in the first place. It's, it's one of the symptoms. But now I had an accurate diagnosis. I had a rare form of blood cancer and after some bloodletting, that's what, what I call it, 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 that's not the medical term for it, it's where they take some blood out of you to give the rest of your blood more room. After some of that I was finally prescribed a drug which is keeping my disorder in check and for this I'm really grateful to God and to our brilliant NHS. Now, <clears throat> diagnosis is vital in the medical profession. Indeed, I suppose it must be a primary, uh, the primary skill of any doctor. If they don't know what's wrong with you, how can they treat you? Imagine how many people would volunteer for sur surgery if they had no knowledge of their illness. A surgeon would be very hard pressed to find patients for surgery without a prior diagnosis. Now this is obvious, but is it in relation to how often the gospel is presented? And I want to suggest it's not for the reasons which I am about to go into. It seems to be the case that the gospel is often reduced to its lowest common denominator by the use of the phrase and often the opening phrase God loves you. It then follows <clears throat> from there that conversion is uh, condensed 
to a sort of condescension to accept the love of Jesus. Often then comes the sinner's prayer. And the question I want to address is this. Is that the gospel? Is that the true way that the gospel should be presented? I suggest it's not, nor does it bear any resemblance to the teaching of the apostles found in the New Testament. Now you can read these in the Bible and make up your own mind, uh, but I'm going to use a summary provided by a Welsh New Testament scholar, an influential um, theologian who studies at Oxford and was ordained as a congregational minister in the early 1900s. Here, here is his summary, having made a study of the way that the apostles preach the gospel. Number one, the age of fulfillment has dawned, the latter days, which was foretold by the prophets. Two, this has taken place through the birth, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Three, by virtue of the resurrection, Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God. Four, the Holy Spirit in the church is the sign of Christ's presence, power and glory. Five, the messianic age will reach its consummation in the return of Christ and six an appeal is made for repentance with the offer of forgiveness the Holy Spirit and salvation. Now you will notice that the apostolic preaching of the gospel did not include Jesus loves you. So how can this lovely phrase be a distortion of that early presentation of the gospel. I'm going to uh, set out what I consider to be the case. First of all, God's love and mercy can only be understood and appreciated when a proper diagnosis has been given and understood by the unbeliever. They must understand the righteousness of God and the sin of humanity, especially their own. They must understand that they stand condemned. There must be conviction, otherwise the mercy and love of God has no meaning. There must be an acknowledgement of their sin through the mediation and the operation of the Holy Spirit before the medicine is applied and received. That's the purpose of the law. It's the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Secondly, whilst the love of God is central to the gospel, there's no doubt about that, it must have its proper place. If it's preached in isolation just by itself, <clears throat> it just affirms a sinner in their present state. It's like a surgeon refusing to tell the patient how ill he is and that's just plain cruel. Thirdly, the gospel begins with the law and our inability to keep it. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law exposes us and leaves us without excuse. The unbeliever, those who hear the gospel but don't believe, when under conviction must feel uncomfortable. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. They won't begin to feel uncomfortable if you begin with God loves you. It's only when we feel the weight of sin and the wrath of God that we are ready for the surgery. Now the surgery is great news. Uh, indeed it's a new heart, it's a heart transplant. Fourthly, look at the first sermon by Peter in Acts. It's interesting to read that and, 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 and see how unlike gospel preaching is so often today. It left the hearers desperate and crying 
what must we do? Peter in reply said, repent. Repentance is God's olive branch to the sinner. It results in forgiveness and reconciliation and peace with God. Now, I ask this question of myself. Why has the gospel message been so diluted, so misrepresented? And perhaps the modern church is concerned that people feel affirmed. The true message might not go down so well with the so-called church growth model, in which case the gospel is jettisoned in favour of successful church growth. That's just my thinking. Ah, but I hear someone say, what about John chapter 3, verse 16? Well, let's take a closer look at the verse, which has been used as a gospel presentation more than any other. The first thing to say is that no text, I repeat, no text from scripture should ever be wrenched from its context. The word text originally meant everything in a book, that is the whole book. But in Christian circles, it's come to mean a verse or a sentence by itself. So what happens is we take a verse and use it in a way <clears throat> that it was never intended. Now this is what I think we have done with John chapter 3 verse 16, which most Christians could recite word for word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish <clears throat> but have eternal life. I learnt it at Sunday school as a small boy. My teacher substituted the name Stephen for the word world and so on to personalise the verse for me. <clears throat> but here's the question. How many people can quote by heart or even know verse 14 or indeed any other verses surrounding verse 16? Not many, I dare to say. Yet those surrounding verses are vital to understand verse 16. Who would just snatch a sentence from a novel to explain the story? It would be absurd, absurd. Yes, that's exactly what we do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's break up the verse and look more closely. First, the word loved. OK, God so loved. What does that mean to an unbeliever? How could he or she understand that word in our English language? They might begin by thinking that God is attracted to me. Um, I must be lovable. I must be special. Well, every person is special to an extent, but that would not be the truth of that verse. For that's not what the word means. Uh, now, many of you will know that there are three common words for love in the Greek language. The first one is eros, which is the love of attraction, primarily sexual love between a man and a woman. God created this, but God does not eros the world. He has not fallen in love with us. The next word is philia, which is the love of attraction, uh, more the love of the mind uh, than the heart. You could easily substitute the word like, uh, but God does not simply like the world. He does not simply philia the world. His love is much more active and powerful than that. The third <clears throat> is agape. This is the love of God, and this love is centred in the will. 
you might use the word care, although it's a, it's not a particularly good um, uh, substitute. But you can see this in care homes at the moment when workers, at least some genuinely care for the folks in the home. They want to do something loving on their behalf. They respond to a need and do something about it. It's centered in the will. God's love is agape love. That's why when Jesus was asked about loving one's neighbors, he told the story of the Good Samaritan who demonstrated agape love. He saw a need and by an act of the will, he did something about it. Now, I've spoken about this on a number of occasions in the church. Because the love of God is centered in the will, it can be commanded. It is the subject of a command when Jesus speaks of it in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Let me read them. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When I got married, the minister did not ask me if I was attracted to Sheila, or if I liked her, or if I was in love with her. No. He said to me, will you love her, comfort her, honour and keep her in sickness and in health? And my response was, I will. Secondly, the word world in that verse in John 3.16, God so loved the world. God loved the human race. Now the word world in the Bible connotes a bad image. It's a fallen, it's a bad world, but God was determined to do something in response to its awful need. Thirdly, the word believes, whoever believes in me. Not just to believe about Jesus, to, be, to be believe in him. I used to use often that fascinating story of Charles Blondin to illustrate the difference between believing and believing in. Now, Blondin was a great showman who walked on a tightrope across Niagara Falls in the summer of 1859. Can you imagine a tightrope stretched over a quarter of a mile spanning <clears throat> the breadth of the Niagara Falls? Blondin walked 160 feet above the falls several times back and forth between Canada and the United States as huge crowds looked on in shock and astonishment. Once he crossed in a sack, once on stilts, another time on a bicycle and once he even carried a stove and cooked an omelette halfway across. He also walked backward with a wheelbarrow. He then asked for some audience participation. The crowd could see he could do these things with ease. There was no doubt about that. He had proven he could. However, now he was asking for a volunteer to get into the wheelbarrow and take a ride across the falls with him. He asked this direct question of the crowd. Do you believe I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? Of course. The crowd shouted. They believed all right, there was no question. Then Blondin posed this question, who will get in the wheelbarrow? And of course there were no takers, because they believed all about him, but they were not prepared to put their belief and trust in him. There's the difference. Whoever believes in me. 
fourthly, the word so. God so loved the world. And to understand the use of the word so, we've got to consider the context more closely, beginning at verse 14 of John chapter 3 and ending at verse 17. Let me read it to you. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have, every, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, to understand the context, uh, the context, we have to go back to Numbers chapter 21. And let me just summarise. There were 600,000 men plus women and children, possibly as many as 2 million, uh, larger than the population of Birmingham. And they were in the desert with no food or water, and it was their own fault. They were God's people. They were the people of Israel in the Sinai Desert. They'd met God at Mount Sinai when they had been betrothed to him in something akin to a marriage. Like with me and Sheila, and we both said, I will. They had said, I will, and God had said the same. They would obey his commandments and God would keep his covenant. They were given the commandments and promised the land, which was about 10 days walk away. They arrived at a place called Kadesh Barnea and sent in 12 spies to spy out the land. You know the story. We used to teach the children in a song, 12 men were sent to spy in Cain and 10 were bad, two were good. 10 spies were afraid. Two spies said, let's go in and possess the land. Now God promised he would take them in on his shoulders, but they decided not to believe in him and stayed where they were. They wandered in the desert for 40 years and the only two who got into the promised land, eventually, of those were the two good spies. Now, in spite of their disobedience, God fed and watered them, but they repeatedly grumbled, missing the more tasty food that they had eaten, even as slaves in Egypt. As slaves in Egypt. Now, they could have gone into the promised land and had all the nice food they ever wanted, but they didn't do so. It was their fault entirely. God sent venomous snakes among them until the people realised this must be from God and they confessed to Moses pleading with him to ask God to take the snakes away. They said, Moses, we've sinned against God and against you, please ask God to take the snakes away. Now God didn't answer in that way, but he provided for them a way of escape from death. God instructed Moses, he said, <clears throat> go and make a bronze snake, attach it to a pole, uh, to a pole uh, go to a hill overlooking the camp and uh, tell the people when you are bitten look at the bronze snake and you will not die. Now back to that word so, for God so loved the world. The word so means this, just as God loved his people in that Old Testament setting, he so, that is in the same manner or way, loved the world in that this time instead of a bronze snake he gave his son 
Now, the word so is not a measure of the intensity of his love, but it is a reference to the past. Sometimes I notice people in texts say so, you know, lots of O's on the end of it, to demonstrate the intensity of how much they feel. But that's not the meaning of the word so in John 3.16. <clears throat> I wonder now if you were to explain to an unbeliever the context of John 3.16, they might be persuaded by preaching that God loves them, they would have every right to question that statement, for without the true gospel being spoken, they're not aware of their personal sin or the fact that they are already dead. Um, I, I've done a transcript of this talk, and on there you'll see a picture of uh, the people of Israel lying sick and uh, looking at the snakes, some of them anyway. Please have a look at the picture. Imagine you are holding one you love in your arms, maybe a son, maybe a daughter, your husband, your wife, and they've been bitten. What would you say to them? Would you say God loves you? Or would you say look and live? I've included on the transcript a, a lovely hymn. Let me just read you the first verse and the, and the chorus. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. This message unto you I'll give. It is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It's only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It is recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Now, <clears throat> I'm coming to an end. I want to ask a very searching question. Do you believe God's character has changed? Do you believe the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, or are they the same God? Is the God of Israel in Numbers chapter 21 the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Is he the same God as we read about in the New Testament? I was uh, in a house group in a meeting in a local church a few years ago when the leader of the group said this, and I quote, God may have shown anger in the Old Testament, but he is no longer angry. Now, she didn't know that what she had said was a heresy hundreds of years old, named after the first man who taught it. His name was Marcion, and the heresy to this day is called Marcionism. The first word of the gospel is not God loves you. Let me repeat. The first word of the gospel is not God loves you. And who better can we turn to than the greatest teacher of all, Jesus Christ, to see what his first words were? And we find them in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. He came and he proclaimed this, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. Look at the final words of Jesus before he left the earth, found in Luke chapter 24 and verse 46. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. There you've got his first words of ministry and his last words on the earth. I'm going to finish with a very chilling quote from Spurgeon. You were too delicate to tell the man that he is ill. 
You hope to heal the sick without their knowing it. You therefore flatter them. And what happens? They laugh at you. They dance upon their own graves and at last they die. Your delicacy is cruelty. Your flatteries are poisons. You are a murderer. Shall we keep men in a fool's paradise? Shall we lull them into soft slumber from which they will awake in hell? Are we to become helpers of their damnation by our smooth speeches? In the name of God, we will not. And I pray in the weeks and months that lie ahead that we will not. But that each of us will faithfully proclaim this gospel of Jesus Christ. That men and women might come to a true place of saving faith and a knowledge and relationship with him. God bless you all.